All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. And this is the second consecutive webinar that I get to come in with a bit of positivity. Continued boost here at S&P, uh, S&P 500. That is, uh, we had looked at this on Tuesday after a pretty key area of support had started to come into play uh, just after the Monday open. So, well, the Sunday night futures open, I guess, more specifically, saw equities dump yet again. But eventually found a bit of support right here. This is the 76.4% Fibonacci retracement of this major move. Taking the 2016 swing low, drawn up to the 2020 swing high. Notice it's right there, that 764 at 2181.9 that helped to stem the bleeding. And then, uh, well, let's go down a little shorter term. Walk through this piece by piece. Now you can even see here where that supported held sellers at, at bay at least for a little while. And it was a slow, slow process with which this started to gyrate higher. Quick little pop there, Monday morning, head of the U.S. equity open. Uh, pullback, saw higher low defense shortly after U.S. equities had opened and continued strength. Now, yesterday was key because we saw price action move from that 764 retracement back above the 618 retracement. And then if we go down a little shorter term, like a four hour chart, you can see where that support had really cauterized in there fairly well. Uh, also confluent with the trend line projection you see in red, the trend line is essentially just coming from the connection of the 2009 and 2011 swing lows. Now that trend line had, had helped to soften the sell off as prices were coming down last week, but it couldn't hold sellers especially through this week's open as prices just lurched down to that 764. Well, we saw a break back above, cauterization at the 618. Now prices look headed right for that 50% marker, 2602. A little bit higher is another very key zone, around 2753 up to around 2790. Now, I think this is something that traders are still going to want to be cautious of. And it's a fairly dangerous spot, in my humble opinion, from a psychological perspective. Because we've become so conditioned over the last decade to look at that buy the dip strategy. Anytime we did get a bit of pressure or a bit of risk, each of these instances, very, very clear, like we had China's Black Monday in August of 2015, that slump held and hung around until like February of 2016. Uh, if you remember the Q4 sell off that we saw in 2018, just before that sparkling 2019 rally came back into play or came into play. Each one of these instances was offset with the Fed getting more loose, more dovish, trying to support the quote unquote wealth effect until price action eventually just went on that run up to fresh all time highs. Now, all of that started to change about a month ago. And we'd even looked at this in one of these Thursday webinars because leading up to that top, just inside of the 3,400 level on the, on, on S, uh, on the SP 500, uh, as we were grinding into that top, I'd made the remark that you know, at that point, bad news was the equity traders, well, their best friend, or at least one of their really good friends. I mean, not their best friend, but one of the really good friends, because the only way to really find one of those dips was to see some element of bad news show up. But uh, I know there's a few folks in the webinar that were in that specific one on February 20th. It was as a really outsized sell-off began to show with no headlines right here. We saw that quick breach of support. It started to highlight that not all was right underneath the surface. And sure enough, that flung into a pattern of lower lows and lower highs that largely continued uh, into this week until we've had this recent spurt of strength that's brought a bit of hope back into the equation. But again, I would be very cautious of chasing this thing lower because the big driver in the headlines, coronavirus, it doesn't feel like we've hit peak yet. I'm here in New York and we're just now at the stage where mania is beginning to take over a little bit. Uh, given what's happening at some of these hospitals, like just reading some of these reports, it's, it's, it's tough. So I don't know that we're through the woods yet. Now, on the other side of that coin, we've seen the Fed and Congress launch an artillery of bazookas. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones had an uh, interview earlier today on CNBC. Paul Tudor Jones is one of the big market voices that I have a ton of respect for. And he had a line that really stood out. He said, this is like a nuclear bomb rather than a bazooka because we're not just seeing the Fed come to back back into uh, QE. We're also seeing the federal government get into action with a $2.2 trillion 
stimulus plan. So there's a case to be made on either side. Sure, there's a lot of fear. There's likely to be some continued growth concerns. Heck, we just got jobless claims this morning, 3.2 million, which is just insane from a data perspective. But on the other side, we have uh, relevant parties trying to backstop markets the best they can. So there really is an excuse for both bulls and bears to get back into the mix here. Uh, as a trader, I want to look at this cautiously. I want to look for some element of resistance to drive in to see if there might be an extension of that short side run at least temporarily. Now, I'm not necessarily looking for support to be taken out yet, but as you can see, we're still in like the second or third inning of this ballgame. If we chart the sell-off that, that, that spans from the February top down to the March low, we still haven't encroached upon the 38.2% retracement of that major move. A little bit higher is where things get interesting. Now, I'd already pointed out a little earlier that 2750 area up to around 2790. So this is an area that's really confluent because there's a few different Fibonacci levels within that same zone. I think this would also have kind of the troubling effect if it does end up coming in as a lower high of really shaking a lot of bulls out of the mix. Because as we get this extension of, of, the, of the current rally, you're seeing that psychology that I had noted a little earlier, that buy the dip psychology coming back into play with full force. But if this thing tops it out and then prices go back down for a retest of those lows around 2200 and just below, then there's even more motivation for those folks to divorce from that psychology, back away from the buy the dip strategy and fully acknowledge like, hey, something's going on here. I maybe want to take a step back. Um, so potential resistance a little bit higher. For now, the theme is hope because we've seen a bit of strength cauterize over a, a few day period, but this does still take on the appearance of a bear market rally. Hate to be a pessimist or sound like a pessimist, but uh, as a trader, I'm kind of uh, cynical. So I would be looking at the other side of this bounce of this rally. Um, now, as I looked at just a couple of days ago, there's, there's a few different ways to cut this up depending on the index that's being looked at. And, you know, all factors considered, the NASDAQ, in my humble opinion, held up fairly well. Fairly well. Again, if we looked at the S&P move over the same relevant period of time, taking the 2016 low up to the 2020 high, the S&P 500 drove down to the 76.4% retracement of that move. Here in the NASDAQ, it only tested the 50% retracement, so a shallower sell-off over that same relative period. The 76.4 retracement that did come into play in the NASDAQ is a much shorter-term move taken from that 2018 swing low up to the 2020 swing high. And again, just to comp this directly with the S&P 500, notice that we actually took out that same swing low here. So this illustrates that of that or from that buy the dip crowd, these high quality tech names, these large cap tech names were a bit more attractive. I mean, I'm thinking companies like Apple, right? Sure, there's the potential for continued slowdown, on the horizon but whenever we come out of this with all of the stimulus that's being pumped in and through markets you have these pristine tech names that are well positioned to take advantage of those runs and so to me here it kind of feels as though i don't want to say a bet on capitalism but it's kind of the theorem that we'll end up working our way out of this mess and that these large cap blue chip tech companies stand in a pretty attractive position to prosper in the future. I think in essence, we've seen some market participants using this recent sell-off as a chance to buy some of these stocks at quote unquote discount levels. Now I say that, but keep in mind, Apple did plunge all the way down to a key level of support earlier this week, 213. Um, comparatively, this is the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement of that same major move we looked at in the NASDAQ, taking the 2018 swing low, came into play on Christmas Eve and drawing that up to the 2020 swing high. Notice how that 618 just perfectly caught that low. Price has bounced up. Now catching resistance to 38.2. I think one of the interesting things to look at for tomorrow, especially if we see stocks back on offer, is looking for a pullback to support around that 50% marker that it helped to hold the low yesterday. And that comes in around 235-ish. But I think that could be a pretty interesting way of approaching the similar uh, type of stratagem or mode 
uh, as the as the buy the dip crowd. Uh, now on the sell the rip crowd or from the sell the rip area, uh, the Dow might actually be one of the more attractive areas to look to do that. Uh, it's another one of these things we looked at on Tuesday, but again, comparatively, if we look at this recent sell-off, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has absolutely been gobsmacked. We got very close to the 50% retracement of the 2009 to 2020 major move, and we didn't get anywhere close in any of these other indices, right? Like the S&P 500, there's that 50% retracement over that same major move. That's all the way down to around the 2K level. Uh, the NASDAQ 100, same. We didn't come close to touching the 50% marker of that major move. Even held above the 38.2, hadn't even tested that yet. Look at that long, fat tail setting underneath that monthly bar. Showing some very attractive, uh, very uh, attractive support response there. Um, anyways, going back to the Dow, if looking for an area to try to uh, play continued risk conversion, the Dow may be one of the more attractive candidates to do so, given how it did sell off more aggressively when that pain was coming into the environment. Now, uh, currently, we're seeing the 50% retracement of that major move we looked at a moment ago, helping to set resistance. Going down a little shorter term hourly chart, there you go. You can see where we just came off of a fresh higher low from that confluent area around the 20,800 spot, catching a bit of resistance off that 50 fib. So short term, there's still scope for further gains. Uh, if looking to catch resistance or if looking to sell this, I think traders are first going to want to wait for this near-term momentum to fade out. And Vinny had a good uh, comment in here as to why that might be the way forward. Uh, Vinny's comment, uh, hello, James, how far would USD have fallen today if Mnuchin didn't say, did not say claims number was irrelevant? So <laughs> this is a really interesting point because we had that, that, that shattering release this morning, 3.2 million jobless claims in the US, which is just outlandish. But we shortly thereafter heard the Treasury Secretary discount it, saying that it's not relevant. And I could see what he's saying because there's been a trove of stimulus launched in the aftermath of all those jobless claims, in the effort of offsetting some of those jobless claims. But to say that they're completely irrelevant, I don't know that I would go that far. Um, but seeing that level of confidence and then taking the earlier commentary from Jerome Powell today that had basically said, we're going to do as much as we can and we're only limited by what the Treasury will allow. Well, the Treasury, that's Steve Mnuchin, who works for Donald Trump, who obviously doesn't want to see this thing crater into, uh, crater into a depression. And so I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing such a heavy hit on the bid so far today. But if I'm looking for short side thesis, and equities, I think the Dow Jones Industrial Average is going to remain one of the more attractive venues until something there shifts. Okay, now Vinny touched on it. Um, this is also a pretty major theme across global markets right now, and that's the US dollar. We finally saw the pressure valve release off of this bad boy after just an amazing topside run. I say amazing, I guess it depends on whether one was long or short. I'm trying to find which chart I should go to just because there's so much to talk about here. But uh, let's start with this one. No, we'll start with this one. Okay, so to really put this in scope, we've got to look at this from the daily, right? And we would even talked about this last year. The dollar was range bound. I think I'd even lamented how boring it had become because it was just basically chopping back and forth between predefined support and resistance levels. Well, be careful what you ask for because that volatility, when it comes, then you're like, what in the world was I wishing? What was, I, what was I wanting back here? But it came in in a very aggressive manner. That same February 20th inflection point that I looked at in stocks in the webinar just a month ago, it played through in FX as well. Initially, with a pretty major sell-off in the US dollar as USD moved from just underneath the 100 handle all the way down to a fresh yearly low. But that was the point at which USD bulls came in with a slingshot and push this all the way up to fresh three-year highs. Now, the area where resistance topped out is really very interesting, especially if we look at this from a longer-term perspective, like go out to a, like a monthly chart. And if we look at what's currently constituting, I believe this is the 17-year high. Yeah, the 17-year high. It's right around this 103 handle. Okay, so I'm gonna mark this down. We're gonna get a little closer and we're really gonna 
really got to dig into this to see what's going on there. All right, so right off the 103 spot, there we go. You can see where there's two consecutive months that have topped out there, December of 2016, January of 2017. If you remember, this was the post-election backdrop, and we had that really amazing rally that showed in November of 2016, December of 2016, as there was the thought that a, a GOP supermajority was going to put the economy on steroids. Well, it also led to a quick, quick run of strength in the U.S. dollar that was quickly followed by a, an aggressive pullback. Now, what makes this really interesting is as this pullback was happening, the U.S. Federal Reserve is one of the few central banks in the world that was looking at raising rates. It's kind of an aside at this point, but uh, it also highlights how monetary policy is not the only driver for currencies. There's other things at play, like fiscal policy, such as we're seeing come into the equation now. Okay, so let's go down to the weekly chart so we can get a little closer with that 103 level. Okay, so again, drawing back to this experience in, uh, or this, this observation, December of 2016 into January of 2017, Notice the way that that 103 level cut off those candlestick bodies. That was like the line with which bulls dare not cross. Four consecutive weeks, they were thwarted by sellers until eventually quick lower low, quick lower high, and then kaput. All the way down for a retest of the 50 fib of this major move, long-term major move, but taking the 2011 low and drawing that up to that 2017 high. It was the 50 fib that ended up arresting that decline in February of 2018. Also. To, in my mind, give some value to the levels that are confirmed by the fact that there was a pretty legitimate support inflection right off of that price. All right, going down a little shorter term, check the daily chart. Okay, you can see where the 14.4% retracement of that same major move is coming in to help set today's support. A little bit deeper, that 96.47 level, that's been in play quite a bit. Helping to set lows earlier in January, just before that failed run at the 100 level. But this could be a fairly interesting level to look at USD continuation scenarios, especially given that we have seen that very aggressive bullish trend come off very quickly to the point where I could get a little shorter term and start trying to get a little pickier with the major move. So I'm just going to take the low from March up to the high from March. And this can help me to derive a, a, a zone, if you will. Now, yesterday, this 23.6 had helped to hold up support, albeit temporarily, but that was cut right through. And notice that we've just cut right through the 38.2 retracement of that major move as well. The area that I would look kind of as my last spot or stop of support, well, there's, there's two. Uh, one is around this 50 fib. It lines up with a prior swing high, this swing high. This was not a 50 fib when this swing high was, was made. But it also is confluent with another zone of relevance around 98.33 to 98.50. And it's kind of a chunky zone between around 98.33 up to around 98.82. I could look for a pullback to support down there. A little bit deeper, the 618 lines up with another level of interest. This is around 97.86, which lines up with 97.70. And this would likely be the point of no return, in my humble opinion, for USD bullish continuation scenarios, looking for the currency to take out that 17 year high that buyers. Just did not want to mess with. Check this out. This is really cool. I'm going to go to like a five minute chart. And look at the way that the dollar just, <laughs> I mean, it just kissed off of that level. I mean, it traded, a, and again, five minute chart. So we're talking about a very fleeting test at this 103 spot before it came tumbling back down. Now, as usual, and just as I had looked at on Tuesday, I don't want to take a one sided approach here. I don't want to punt on the dollar. Uh, across major currency pairs and just hope that it works. Instead, I want to try to split the play. I want to try to find a couple of areas that are attractive for dollar strength in case that bullish trend does in fact come back. And then I want to look for a couple of areas that could be accommodated for USD weakness in case this recent momentum on the basis or on the back of all of this central bank and all of this, this congressional action, in case it continues to drive markets, stocks higher, dollar lower, risk on for everybody. Very different theme, but at this point, as, as traders, I, th I think I, both scenarios need to be entertained. Okay, so the one that I had looked at for short USD scenarios uh, on Tuesday, or one of the options, was over here in Euro dollar. And it was, I was just looking for a quick play because this thing was so stretched and it was still holding within a bear flag formation, but it looks like that bear flag is not yet going to give way. Now, when we had looked at this on Tuesday, prices were like right in here. There we go. There's two o'clock 
It was testing the support side of that channel. It hadn't yet broken. As a matter of fact, I even have those lines in the sand that I was looking at to equate for a short side break, reopening the door for bearish continuation. That didn't happen. Instead, that dollar sell-off took, took place with force. And this was the zone that I was looking to for resistance. Runs between, uh, runs between around 109.63 up to around 110. 109.63 being the 38.2% Fibonacci retracement of the recent sell-off. And 110, of course, being a major psychological level that had brought in a ton of support in Q4 of last year. Here, I want to want to show where that had taken place. I got it on one of these charts. When things get volatile, my charts get a little bit messier, unfortunately. Uh, but it's right around that 110 spot right in here. You see where price action came down, began testing, actually caught a test in October, but another test in no November and later in the month. Then again in January, and then a forceful February finally saw bears take it out on the way down to fresh two-year lows. Well, we had even fresher two-year lows that were set last week. And now this thing has rallied like a slingshot. Okay, 109.65 up to around 110. That was the zone I was looking to for resistance. But notice there hasn't been anything or much at all showing for resistance in that zone. Instead, prices are on their way back up to a retest of the 50 Fib. And that's another interesting area to look at. It's around 110.62, which aligns fairly well with this group of prior swing lows. These swing lows that uh, were not catching Fibonacci support at the time because this Fibonacci retracement did not come alive until the low was in place right there. So yeah, it's 109.63 up to 110. Next zone of resistance, just setting ahead, around 110.50 up to around 110.65. Beyond that, another really big zone comes into play, that 111.87 to 112.12. And at this point, I think I'd want to extend that down to include the 38.2 retracement of this same major move. So the zone's going to be a little thicker, about the 33 pips-ish. But another area to look for follow through resistance in euro dollar. This feels like a dollar move to me, especially with how aggressively this thing has spiked. It feels like we're just seeing that pressure valve released as risk aversion takes a step back, as there has been a literal nuclear artillery. I shouldn't use literal with that, but there has been a nuclear artillery of stimulus launched at this thing. And so that pressure valve is releasing, and this thing is rallying pretty hard. But a couple different areas to look to for resistance potential. And should that top out? Should that begin to find resistance? Uh, and that would make it attractive on the long side of the U.S. dollar. Now, on the short side of the dollar, looking at the long side of euro, I think there could be a challenge here, just given how aggressively this thing has run. The most recent swing low that I have on my charts all the way down around 109. You know, and it syncs up okay-ish with the prior area of resistance around 108.90. Uh, but that could be a really wide stop and a really very stretched move that could make the long side of this very challenging. Uh, dollar CAD. Okay, well, Dollar CAD finally retested that 140 level. All right, we'll go with that one. Okay, finally retested that 140 level. Now, we had talked about psychological levels in, uh, in the Parent Tuesdays webinar. Actually, I got a better chart that I wanted to use for that. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah, we talked about psychological levels on Tuesday and, and the way that they were playing a really important role here in dollar CAD, specifically that 145 spot. It was actually resisting on Tuesday at 145 when we were looking at it. You can see where those lower highs came in. Now, at the time, I was looking at this as a bull pennant, seeing if it was going to have a top side break, taking out resistance, giving me the option or the, 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 the potential move up for a retest of that 146.90 level that currently sets the 17-year high. That did not happen. This thing folded over, folded over, ran all the way down to that 140 spot. We see sellers are starting to pull up a little bit, a little bit short at that point, pun intended. There you go. You can see where sellers are just like shying away. We're six pips off of 140. Makes a difficult prospect for, for bearish continuation scenarios there. Right? You can see we're even like 125 pips off of this recent swing high from earlier this morning. If we want to go for that swing high, well, now we're looking at about 200 pips. It's a lot of risk in a well developed move, setting very near a psychological level that might not have much more 
more juice to squeeze. Um, so I think that this one remains attractive on the long side of the US dollar, given how aggressively this pullback has shown. And then if we just chart this up over the past, say, few weeks, Notice how even when we were getting that USD weakness theme in late February, dollar CAD remained relatively strong, all factors considered. So even as USD weakness has shown a bit of promise in 2020, CAD weakness has outpaced it. So if I am looking for something to hold uh, US dollar or long US dollar exposure, I think doing so against the Canadian dollar could be a pretty attractive way of doing it. Um, now, back to nitty gritty and let's a Fibonacci retracement on this major move. I'll put this in scope. Notice where that 140 spot aligns very well with a 38.2. That 38.2 coming in for an assist right there. Now, if this area does not hold the lows, the next spot to look at for a reload and bullish continuation is around the 50 fib, taking place right around the 138 level. I don't have a lot of additional resistance or prior support inflections to denote any additional value behind this level, but it being the 50 fib, if it does move back for a retest, I can still keep the door open for bullish scenarios. And, and, and the presumption that this trend may have some continuation power until that 17 year high is retested. I mean, but notice how close we came to taking that level out. 146.68 is the current top, 146.90 is the 17 year high. And, you know, similar to what we'd seen in some of these psychological levels and in, 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 uh, in previous charts that we had looked at. Right, it's almost like buyers were staring at the risk reward scenario as price action was like 25, 30 pips away from a retest of that 17 year high. And they're like, eh, I'm good. Trends well developed. Canadian dollar is very weak. US dollar is very strong, but I'm good for now. I'll wait, look for a pullback. Well, we got a 38 2 pullback. It might put in a 50 pullback, but uh, if, if, if uh, for those that are looking at ways of onloading long USD exposure, I think this one still remains pretty attractive given the spate of Canadian dollar weakness that has shown and continue to show throughout 2020 trade. All right, I got to go a little bit faster now um, because I wanted to look at a few other markets and I want to make sure I answer as many questions as I can. Uh, Swissy had looked at a resistance set on this one uh, on Tuesday off of that 99.02 level. Came in quick, came in very quick, very aggressively. Um, prices have peeled off of that 99.02 level, currently finding a bit of support off 38.2 of the same Fibonacci retracement that helped to find that, that resistance. At this point, this one does feel a bit oversold. So I think traders looking for short side continuation are likely going to want to look for some element of a pullback. And about the closest level that I have for something of that nature is around the 97.17 area. That was a quick swing low that had previously given some support and resistance inflections. May come back into play, but it's the nearest level that I have to look for pullback scenarios in dollar Swiss. Uh, the Fibonacci retracement that I'm speaking of, I think this is something that folks uh, may want to look at or put on their charts or at least just dig around and investigate on. It spans from the 2016 swing high down to the 2018 swing low, that same February 2018 swing low. And of note, notice the way that price has just caught support right there to retest of that prior low before bouncing up to that 618 retracement. And on the way, you can see there's a few other tests along various Fibonacci levels, like the 30 or uh, excuse me, the 20, uh, 23 6. Good little dose of resistance here before a retest. 38 2, another good little dose of resistance here. 50 Fib didn't show much for resistance, but that 618 sure did. And prices are now back to that 38 2. Feels a little bit stretched for short term strategies, but the move I like. The resistance I like, the adherence to these Fibonacci levels I like, and that's something that's going to uh, keep that Fibonacci retracement on my charts as as uh, something that could be worthwhile from an analytical perspective. Okay, dollar yen. Okay, so this is a reason to try not to attempt preempting breakouts. Well, we had also looked at this one on Tuesday. Let me get the uh, proper chart here because there's a lot going on in this one. There we go. I also looked at this one on Tuesday. Now. The Fibonacci retracement in question is a really long-term one. It takes the 1998 swing high, draws down to the 2011 swing low. And it's the 50% marker of that major move that is coming in to help mark current resistance. You can see off of this monthly bar just how chaotic things have been. 
I wouldn't quite call that a doji. That body's a little too big, but we still have almost a full week of trade left. So this could end up as a really nasty long-legged doji. And if that happens, you know, basically a long-legged doji is just even more indecision. It's, it's an even more loaded scenario than a standard doji. Right. Dojis could be really interesting because it hi highlights indecision. That indecision is, is something that can occasionally or oftentimes turn. Terrible for timing, but good example of how you often see a lot of dojis showing up around inflection points in a market. But as noted, it's not always perfect for timing. You get these little spinning tops after a pullback. And you know, kind of the, the modal there, the message there is the fact that buyers are coming back into play to thwart sellers after that pullback. And then the higher low that, that, that's provided by that theme. Just the simple deductive nature of the fact that sellers aren't able to push down for a retest of those lows could be enough to start making the other side of the scenario attractive. And sure enough, here in, in dollar yen, this is all the way back in 2012, um, a spinning top led into a, an absolute launch on the charts. Then you look at this really strong move where we had jumped from uh, sub 80 in October of 2012 all the way up to like 103 in May of 2013. Then even as that pullback comes in, notice what starts showing up, spinning top, doji, doji. So I'd probably call that a dragonfly doji, but again, we're just splitting hairs there. Anyways, um, the 50% marker of that long-term major move is what's helping to set current resistance. And as we looked at on Tuesday, there was, uh, let's go a little tighter, there we go. Uh, there was an ascending triangle forming, as you can see where there's these higher lows along with that horizontal resistance. And so I was looking for breakout scenarios. Breakout never happened. That resistance held, and then held again, and the price has snapped right back to this near-term support, back below 110. Uh, looking at this on a daily chart, and you can see where this is just absolutely erratic. I think this is a very tough thing to try to guess which direction it may run to next. I think as a human being, when we see one of these patterns, Aggressive move down, V-shaped reversal, resistance coming in in a similar area. I think the human mind automatically wants to fill in the blanks, expecting prices to come right back down. You gotta be really careful with that. Because in my humble opinion, at least, that's one of those areas of human nature that doesn't necessarily help us as traders. Because let's be realistic. There's no free lunch out there. And anything that's known about dollar yen at this point is likely priced into some degree by the major players that are feeding these prices into markets, i.e. market makers who have an asymmetric flow of information, and at least what I have. So I'd be very careful of looking for that bearish continuation setup or that bearish setup to continue. Uh, instead, I think what could be interesting here is just focusing on the short term, seeing if there is a short term trend that might turn into a longer term theme. And you'll see, we haven't even pulled back 23.6% of this recent bullish move. So it might still have some room to go. Uh, the level that does appear to be helping to set some support, you can see it's coming off that trend line. Again, another one of these is really easy to find. Take it off the weekly chart, the 2015 swing high. Connects very well with the October 2018 swing high. Then there's this follow through confirmation. Was even back in play in like uh, January of this year. Right, because see where that projection is coming in to currently help set a bit of support. So for those that are uber aggressive, that might be enough, especially if we see a couple of four hour bars with candlestick wicks just hugging around that trend line projection, showing the buyers are in fact responding even before a 23.6 retest. But this is one that I would, I would want to relegate to a shorter term type of scenario. And then again, if we're just charting so that we could do a bit of comparative analysis, we're just charting the past three weeks and the US dollar taking that March 9 low up to the March 19 high. Notice how we've already pulled back beyond the 38.2% retracement in DXY. Same major move. In dollar yen, we haven't even crossed the 23.6. So similar to the way that, that additional CAD weakness was filling into long dollar CAD breakouts and trend scenarios in January and February, there might be a similar theme to work with here as yin weakness is helping to offset some of this recent rush of USD weakness, helping to produce more mild pullback, all factors considered.
Okay. Um, two last FX setups I wanted to look at. I'm going to start taking some questions. Uh, cable. So was looking at a potential for 120 resistance to holding cable on Tuesday. That's not resistance. Prices have just blown right past that. So there's a couple of different uh, or interesting things to work with off of this chart in uh, my humble opinion. But I got to walk down. So monthly chart. Uh, we had looked at that that massive sell-off that, pro that bought prices down all the way down to that 115 spot. Trend line projection, uh, 1985 swing low connected to the 2016 swing low. You can see where that 115 psychological level helped to sell stop sellers dead in their tracks. And this week so far, it's been a pretty aggressive bounce. You can see where we even started with a bit of grind down around that level before that pressure valve was released, uh, was released off that USD theme and prices have rallied aggressively. Now, again, just doing some comparative analysis. Draw Fibonacci retracement over that same relevant major move. Now we have crossed the 38.2 here. That 50 fib runs up around 123. And that could be another spot to look at for some resistance. But if we look at the short-term momentum, it's not playing around. I think you'd want to be very, very careful of trying to catch a top here. Instead, maybe waiting for resistance to set in, maybe even allowing a short-term series of lower lows and lower highs to develop first as some element of confirmation that sellers might actually, in fact, be able to jump in. But you can see where this thing has been stretching aggressively to the upside. When I see a move like this, I automatically want to think that it's a short cover type of scenario. Just because it's so rigid in the opposing direction of what had sent price action down there in the first place. So it feels like short cover to me after cable set a fresh 35-year low. I wouldn't let that fact escape me. It just set a fresh 35-year low. So it's rational that some short cover will take place after a 1,800-ish pip move develops over about a two-week period. It's amazing, right? That top, early March, 132. The bottom, 114. Just a quick back of the envelope math. We're looking at 1,786 pips over a two-week time span. So yeah, it was probably out of breath. Probably needs to take a break, drink some Gatorade, get ready for round two, if it is going to continue, that is. All right, and last but certainly not least, another one of these uh, pairs that was so oversold, so waterlogged, and it snapped back pretty aggressively, but maybe not as aggressively as was shown in cable. Uh, let's go a little shorter term. There, there we go. Not quite as aggressively as was shown in cable. Now, in Aussie... Uh, it, it absolutely lurched lower earlier this month, finally catching some, some support above the 55 handle, which is confluent with the 88.6% retracement of this major move, the 2001 bottom to the 2011 top. It's right there around that 55 spot where sellers finally pulled up. All right, now weekly chart, you can see where we have another one of those aggressive reversals similar to cable, albeit more tempered. So maybe like you can consider like less of a short cover type of theme. Um, now I looked at this rising wedge formation on Tuesday, copying this to what was showing in Euro dollar. Now at the time, Euro dollar, if you remember, was showing in that bear flag, that that trend channel. Let me see. I believe I still have it on at least one of these charts. There we go. You can see where that trend channel, right? Parallel resistance to support. And buyers have just run roughshod through that resistance area, taking out that 110 level in the process, right? But if, again, we look at the same relevant period in Aussie dollar, right? There was much more trepidation around highs or at resistance than there was in that Euro dollar move. And while Euro dollar is breaking away right now, there's still a bit of pressure in Aussie. So what this says to me is between Euro and Aussie, if I am looking for that long USD theme to come firing back, Aussie is a bit more attractive. Got a resistance hold inside of the 61 handle. We're trading above that psychological level right now. You can see off this two-hour chart where there's even been a couple of uh, or a few consecutive wicks cutting through that 60-55 area, hoping to show a bit of resistance, go a little shorter term. Five-minute chart. There you go. It looks like it wants to start making a series of lower lows and lower highs. It did, in full disclosure, just set IRI just like an hour ago. But if I'm looking for long USD scenarios, given that this one hasn't moved 
as aggressively on the long side as cable, this would remain a little bit more attractive in my humble opinion. Okay, that's what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. Do my best. Do my best. Mr. Patrick McKenna. Um, and a few people have, have, have said this, but I just want to mention Mr. McKenna because uh, he's consistently every, every webinar, just such a solid, nice guy. Hi, James. Hope all is well on your side. I cannot complain. Um, you know, I'll be honest. You know, seeing all this stuff happen in the headlines, I'm a pretty empathetic dude. It, it's really, really sad for me. And, you know, you, uh, folks might have been able to tell in previous webinars, I didn't want to, like, get too exuberant around the volatility or some of the setups that we're showing because, I mean, there's people that are fighting for their lives, nurses, doctors. They're in uh, the descriptions that I've read or heard that New York City is like a third world country right now. New York City feels like a war zone. Uh, there was that one thing that was circulating. Um, the doctor said he had Ebola before. He caught and contracted Ebola, but coronavirus scared him. I mean, you read something like that. That's 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 a tough pill to swallow. But um, fairly optimistic at the, I mean, I'm fairly optimistic at this point. Uh, hopefully, these uh, brutal market sell-offs have quelled for the time being, so that we can at least focus on. Uh, on, on solving the meat of the matter, which is the, the virus itself, the pandemic. Uh, Mr. William O'Keefe, good to see you in the room, my friend. Good day, James. The buy on the euro dollar. He's been, uh, Mr. O'Keefe has been buying and selling on the way up, my friend. Hey, that's beautiful, man. So it's, it's a good reversal you caught there in USD. Um, you know, I think just the big question, especially on euro right now, is just, just can it continue? Because, you know, and this is something that I had looked at last week where I was starting to get maybe a little more frightened because all of these stimulus actions were seemingly being ignored across risk markets. I mean, we were seeing the Fed launch bazooka after bazooka after bazooka, and, and then stocks were going limit down, limit down, limit down. And it, it was almost as if there was a glaring signal that something underneath the surface wasn't right. And then when I saw this, or when I was watching this, I was just absolutely frightened that there was something amiss. Uh, this is TLT. This is 20 plus year US treasuries. But if you see the way this thing traded from that March 9th high, March 9th low in the USD, down to the March 18th low in TLT, this is insane. This is treasuries we're talking about. Treasuries. That's a move of 22.61% in less than 10 days, two of which were closed for the weekend. That is an outlandish level of volatility in a very key market, 22.6%. So I was starting to get worried that there was something structurally wrong. I, I'm still not convinced that there isn't. I think one of the positive factors we have now is, is kind of how the Fed has positioned this bazooka to be unlimited in scope if need be. And it kind of goes back to a, a comment from Hank Paulson in the first financial collapse. When he said, if they think the bazooka is big enough, you don't even need to fire it. And so I, uh, again, just as a human being, I'm hopeful that something like that is taking place. The Fed basically said, hey, look, we're only constrained by what the Treasury is going to cut us back on. <laughs> They're not going to cut us back. So, I, I, you know, hopefully that's what we're seeing. And, and, and hence, there's been a bit of stabilization in, in that theme this week as we have started to see stocks rise. And, and, and there's a bit of calm, relatively speaking and treasury rates, which again, in my humble opinion, is a very, very, very good thing. There you are. We're just knocking around 1.3 in 30 year. Not great. I mean, it's not a huge growth number, but you know, again, it's not peeling back and forth 20% in 10 days. Trading like a cryptocurrency, basically. 10 year yields right there, settling in right at around 0.8%. I can live with that. But at least we're not seeing those 20% uh, runs in like in, in less than two week periods. Uh, from Javago, Javago, here Euro dollar is traveling to, and what is your prediction? As a rule, I try not to make predictions. It's worthless because I don't know the future any better than anybody else, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. Um, the only thing that experience has taught me in trading is how utterly unable I am to predict the future. And so I don't even mess with that stuff. I try to use analysis combined with risk management to get a bit of an edge. Right. So like if I see a resistance level coming into play and I get a couple of what I consider to be signals that sellers are responding to that, 
and I get an area where I might be able to try to risk a dollar in the effort of making two, that's the type of stuff that I look for. But you know, I'm not going to dress it up as like, oh, I'm going to predict this because if it comes right, you know, then I got to say, oh, well, I predicted that, implying that I did something that I didn't, right? And I, and I didn't because I guessed that, right? Now there are different ranges of guesses. There are educated guesses. There are random guesses. I try to look at trade entries as a as a hypothesis, where it's the best educated guess with the information that I have at my disposal. And about the best that I could do is implement some fairly standard technical analysis, look for those little angles or edges, and then go to work, do my thing. Wash, rinse, and repeat. But I gotta, you know, if if I do hold to that prediction thing, you know, where I think that I'm smarter or 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 I could see the horizon better than I actually can. Well, that's one of the things that'll often kind of get in my head. And I think like any other retail trader and saying, hey, remove the stop. You got this one, right? Your dollar's got to go back down. The European economy's in you know, a really tough spot. The ECB can't do much more. Dollar's got to go up. It was screaming higher just last week. You know, that, that's when the, the mental negotiation, I think, again, one of those weaknesses of human psychology begins to play out. So I don't even try to do it. I don't try to predict it. I just try to use analysis the best I can to find trade ideas for what might happen next, full well knowing that I can't predict the future. Uh, Pete Malos, hey, good to see you, my friend. Uh, 30 companies or 500 will swing larger. Well, it depends. Depends on the dispersion of what those 30 companies are, you know. Um, you know, if we're looking at like the 30 largest large caps, which we're not necessarily, but if we were, um, then I would want to think that it's somewhat of a statistical representation of of uh, of the S&P. You know, if we were looking at it from a sheer size basis, we're not, but um, but yeah, there's definitely some st some statistical error there that could be explained by this one. Boeing was absolutely tanking when the sell-off was happening. They were kind of getting hit on both sides because not only did they have that uh, that liability from the 737 Max, but they got a very major problem with demand at airlines. Uh, so this is the the rational explanation as to why the Dow was hammered so aggressively around this recent move. <laughs> uh, Pete, really good comment here. Clients are asking me if uh, they should buy stocks here. I say, sure, as long as you hold indefinitely. Yeah, I get a lot of these text messages from buddies that I went to school with or grew up with or whatever. And, um, you know, my quote to them is always the same. Professional traders don't try to pick bottoms because they know that's impossible. You know, so, you know, and, and again, no trading advice. Whatsoever, just looking at this from like a logical statistical perspective, I think for somebody that is looking to be a long-term investor, I think about one of the best things they can do is try to split the difference to try to average it out. You know, so, you know, maybe taking a portion of what they're looking to invest and, you know, maybe trying to pick a point in the pullback. And if it continues pulling back, okay, well, you can buy some more. You could dollar cost average that long-term holding or what you're expecting to be a long-term holding. And then if it pulls back even more, maybe again, you know, and and you know, don't don't give it more than three strikes because you might end up just, you know, throwing good money after bad at that point. But you know, I think that's about the best that an individual investor can do because timing the market traditionally, especially for 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 um, retail investors with very little uh, experience, is very dangerous. It's possible to do long term. You know, and again, it comes kind of comes back to the you know, you got to kind of guess. It's a daunting thing to do if we're talking about like retirement funds or or uh, safety funds, things like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as long as you hold indefinitely, that's a that's a that's a good quote, my man. Uh, Tumuno Aminko Taraya, uh, the dollar absolutely fell out of the sky, massive. Cable has performed really well these last few sessions. Everything relative, right? You know, and I, I think that's one of the reasons, and if there is any lesson to take from all of this, it's a reason to fix to the time frame or set your time frames and your strategy and just stick to those, right? Because there's always a bull market somewhere, especially when we're looking at two-sided FX pairs. But, you know, if we look at how massive that run in the dollar was, I mean, it was amazing. 
It was 8.8% non-levered in a single currency in like 10 days. At this point, we've given a portion of that back, but it hasn't even been 50% of that prior major move. And, and cable kind of corresponds to that, right? It just got so incredibly oversold or, or uh, so incredibly bearish that once we test below that 115 spot, you know, any new sellers that are looking at it are like, do I really want to sell this thing at 114.46? 114.56? 114.76? I don't know, man. It's off 1,800 pips in the last three weeks, two weeks. I don't know if I want to do that. You know, so that's often why we'll see these 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 bear market reversals or these uh, these bear market rallies showing with a ton of strength because you got short cover coming in and then you got folks saying, hey, well, maybe there's a reversal in here. Maybe I can, let's take this back. And then it can kind of take on a life of its own. But yeah, just keep it in relative scope of what has been happening. And, and you know, from a, again, from a humanity perspective, I hope that calm continues to prevail. I really do. But, you know, as a, as a trader, I got to look at the other side of the matter. You know, this didn't just come out of nowhere. This massive sell-off in cable that almost saw two big figures or uh, 20 big figures, 2,000 pips almost taken out of this thing in like two weeks. That happened. Can't undo it. You know, so at this point, we're clawing back a, a portion of it. And there might be some continuation power on that yet. Because those same folks were saying, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to sell this at like 114.86. Well, they're going to start thinking at some point, I don't know if I want to buy this at 122. It was at 114.46 just a week ago. But yeah, it, it's, you know, if we're looking at this on a short-term basis, that's been some rip and then, uh, you know, a huge, huge fall from uh, USD. Uh, William O'Keefe, I'm looking for the uh, 112 area on the bull euro dollar, James. Yeah, it's a, it's a level that keeps coming back, right? And... Uh, I forget who said it, but somebody made the comment in the webinar when this thing was slicing through that that old gap at like 107 and a quarter, like, oh, I guess 112's gone. And I was like, ah, I would be surprised if it's gone for good. That 112 level, it's it's pretty legit. Um, I'm drawing this off the monthly chart, 2000 swing low, 08 swing high, 618 of that major move, just right there, 112, 12. Helped to set resistance for like two years when Euro was ranging around. Started to come back into play Q4 2018. Right there, like November. I actually tested down to it in March. Held the lows in April. Temporarily sunk below in May. Back above in June, support again. But this was like the last stop before that sell-off really got started in earnest again. Uh, reversion to the mean early January and then right back down. But uh, yeah, I would be surprised if 1212 leaves us for good. <laughs> And then Pete says, 112.12, no. Yeah, I mean, eventually I might just put these webinars on repeat, right? Hey, 112 is back again. Let's see if I can catch a swing. Something like something along those lines. Uh, Pete, great point in loony weakness in a weaker greenback environment. Yes, sir. Yeah, Canadian dollar and uh, also from Pete, Canadian dollar, still weaker than the buck. Yeah, so I'm keeping that one on the, on the long side of the ledger for now, looking um, you know, for long USD scenarios. Oh, wow. Uh, Mr. Vinnie Palma, James, if you have a moment, can you please check if crude has a line to 975? Yes, 975. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, oops, sorry. Um, but uh, I love how he reiterated it there. So, yeah, when we get in, you know, and, and you know, again, I kind of touched on this a little earlier about knowing your edge or your angle as a trader. And mine is, is to me, it's it's brutal honesty and acknowledgement that I can't, nor will I ever be able to predict the future, so I don't even try. Um, I think about the best that I could do is use analysis to try to find uh, you know, short-term areas of potential opportunities, ways that I could try to risk a dollar to make two, kind of like any other entrepreneur is gonna do in their business, right? Use a finite amount of resources to try to grow those resources into a bigger amount of less finite resources. I look at trading in the same way. It's just I don't have to set up a storefront. I don't have to deal with others, and, and by and large. Um, 
But when we get in one of these scenarios where outlandish things are happening, like crude's crushing down to a, what do we have? It's an 18-year low at this point, but it could end up being a lot lower than that. But when we get in one of these scenarios when new stuff is happening, we have to widen out our expectation of what else might happen, right? Kind of goes back to what I was saying a couple of weeks ago when volatility was really picking up. The only thing that we know from increased volatility is there's an increased range of possible scenarios with which things might template or take place. Uh, so in crude, I'm I'm very much in that in that mode right now, given how aggressive the sell-off has been, given how how bears have continued to push. Looking at it from a geopolitical perspective, it doesn't look like anybody's got a vested interest to try to step in here. It looks like we're in a full-fledged oil price war. Um, so I would not dismiss that 975 level. Now, as far as getting some reference as to why that might come into play, that might prove the challenge. I see where Vinny's taking that. <laughs> 1986 swing low right there at 975. Uh, we have not touched down there since. What's that? That came close to a, uh, to a $10 test. I don't know if we got it though. That was like, yeah, it was like 1065. I still remember this. I was graduating high school at the time and I had just gotten my first car and gasoline at the local gas station was 79 cents. The, uh, the, the, uh, the brand racetrack had just opened up there. And they wanted to make like a big statement. So they, you know, everybody else was like at a dollar nine or something like that. They went down to 79 cents. I felt like a king because I could drive wherever I wanted. It was a fun time. But uh, yeah, even back then, you know, we didn't, we didn't cross that $10 marker. That could be interesting, you know, trading inside of that psych level, um, you know, with that reference, that 1985, 1986 swing low. But yeah, we haven't been down there in 34 years. But yeah, there's something there at nine and three quarters. For sure. What I do know is if it crosses 10, it's going to make a tough, tough prospect to sell below that. There's also probably going to be some, some carnage amongst the banks. And that's just my guessing because there's uh, that was a big theme for back in 2015 when oil prices were really coming off aggressively. There was a fear of um, you know producers not being able to pay back banks and then banks can, and bank contagion amongst uh, other banks. It was a legit theme, a legit fear back then. You know, so you know, I hope it doesn't come back into play, but I think if we do push down there, 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 there might be some collateral damage. Another interesting thing is, is how much of this recent sell-off is coming directly from coronavirus and then how much is coming from an oil price war. It's difficult to tell right now, right? Because both these themes kind of, kind of came in at the same time, more or less. Um, from Al Tarragon. Hi, hello. Do you have a webinar where you were explaining uh, Joe to use Fibo? Please, thank you. I, you know, not one that I can recall. I kind of mix it in uh, through the analytical webinars. I think the best resource that I have for that, if you just type in Fibonacci, James Stanley, Fibonacci in the Forex market, that article right there kind of gives a synopsis of how I use it. And I'm, I apologize for suggesting to use Google. That's just the easiest way of finding the specific article. Just Fibonacci in my name, and uh, you'll find this one right here from a few years ago. For these types of educational pieces, I always find uh, the written word to be a little bit better because there's there's um, less opportunity for miscommunication. I can put it out real clearly. I can explain it with a visual. I think that that's, uh, that's, that's my preferred way of, of talking about stuff like this. Ooh, good question, uh, Prince Stan. Thank you, great stuff as always. Does gold appear to be heading back towards 1650, 1700 price ranges? I think so. That's just, again, my guess. But, you know, the bid came back with aggression this week. Uh, and, and, you know, again, we have all of this central bank action. I think this is something that, that, that could continue running higher. Uh, yesterday brought a bit of a pullback into the mix, but you know even that was, was somewhat softened or slowed, and we just pushed up to a fresh near-term high. So I, I think it does have scope for further gains in it, especially if the dollar ends up, you know, continuing that pullback. Uh, all right, I'm going to rapid fire last few questions here. Uh, I think I'll be able to take about four more. Um, from Pete, great looks all around, James. After some big counter trend moves in a month and a quarter, flows to consider as well, and the elephant in the room being the virus. We just don't know enough about the virus yet which is unfortunate, um, but you know, hopefully we're turning a corner on that, 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 that risk theme being priced in the markets. I think that's about the best that we have right now is hope. 
uh, from uh, is that a Vika? Vika Kanderlik. Uh, regarding Aussie Swiss fundamentals, Australia would be harmed the most due to uh, luck down because their economy depends on imports. Uh, CHF is backed by strong gold. I'm looking for a 55 target. What is your opinion about it? I'll be real honest with those types of things. I have a tendency to uh, not really give a lot of weighting to it because, and again, this just goes back to my humble opinion. You know, if you look at the, the, the folks that have a Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, these real well built investment banks, they've got numbers and information that I don't have access to, to substantiate those fundamental arguments way better than I ever will. So when I look at a cross synthetic pair like Aussie Swiss, I have a tendency to just rely a little bit more on technical analysis and, and trying to find those angles or those potential angles that, that might show. Um, Aussie Swiss has basically been a one-way train or was a one-way train through February and most of March. I still have this in a spot that could substantiate short side continuation scenarios. Let's go down a little tighter hourly chart. There we go. All right. We just set this recent swing high, but then we set a, a lower low. And now it looks like we have another lower high that's brewing in here on the hourly chart. And maybe there's something to the fundamental argument. I don't want to say that there isn't because I don't know, but uh, I would be hesitant to set this one up on that basis. Uh, from Quizaluxa, uh, what's up with gold and silver? They're coming back to life. The silver, not to the same tune of gold, but I think that's something that could end up playing out at some point, uh, You know, especially if we do see this drubbing in the US dollar continue. Okay, so the last question of the day. This is a good one from Vinny. James, on the stability of the financial system, what we've seen is clear evidence the economy is built on a house of cards and a foundation of debt. In the end, we will prevail, but we need to adjust. All the best, Vinny, former New Yorker. Hey, long to high five uh, to a former New Yorker. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple arguments to it. Uh, I think uh, I'm not saying, you know, anything counter to what Vinny's saying, but I think, you know, one of the things that I've heard, I just, I, I don't see it myself, is something from, uh, there was like a comment from Bernanke a couple of days ago that said the big difference between now and 08 is that the financial system is, uh, you know, much more structurally sound. And so I'm just kind of taking him at his word and hoping that that's the case. You know, but as I looked at last week, when you see treasuries peeling off 20% in a 10 day period, something is amiss, something is up. What exactly? I have no clue, but it's enough to make me unnerved to the point where I might not want to be as aggressive in taking on a risk exposure. Because something is shifting under the surface, I don't know what, that's the time to be scared, not, uh, not greedy. All right, so I got uh, one last one from Demetrios, a uh, longtime friend I haven't seen in a bit. So we'll, we'll end on this one. Hey, James, how are you getting on, my friend? All good in Greece for the moment, other than the fact that we're all grounded as the rest of the world, of course. This history in the writing, once again, the world is falling apart. Anyway, for me, I forget about money for now. Let's hope that people don't die and economies recover eventually. Stay safe and well. Thank you for that note, my friend. Um, so I'm just going to be as, as perfectly honest as I can. Uh, I don't have much tolerance for myself being downtrodden for very long. I think that it's acceptable to feel bad because we're human beings and it's going to happen. But I also think it's on me to guide my actions in response to those negative stimuli. So I'm just going to try to make the best out of this whole situation, the, the best that I can. I'm going to hope that it turns out well, but I'm also going to keep my expectations primed for the fact that it might not. And there might be more bad stuff in the headlines. And I got to deal with it. I got to live with it. But if I put myself in a fairy tale land of where, you know, I'm expecting to wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden the coronavirus headlines aren't going to be all over my Twitter feed and all over my email inbox, well, I'm just setting myself up for failure. So I've, I've, what I've done is something that I think each of you, ladies and gentlemen, could do, especially those of you that are in ordered lockdowns. I set a list of five things I want to improve upon by the time this whole thing is over. So that when I am getting back into the office, when I am circulating with society and civilization again, I'm a better, more well-oiled machine. And this could be a lot of different things. Like for me, and I'll just give you a couple of them. One, I uh, wanted to square up my diet a little bit better, right? Because having a kid, working in the city, life gets busy. So you have a tendency to order out or, or maybe slack a little bit on some of those things. So I'm just going to tighten up my diet. Uh, wanted to learn Spanish. Been wanting to learn or get better at Spanish for a long time. Boom. Got more time to learn Spanish. Even speaking Spanish to my son. So with hope. This little guy is going to be trilingual when he, when he finally starts talking. Russian from the mom, English from both of us, and 
hopefully Spanish for me. Now, I know there's a lot of bad stuff out there. And the last thing I want to do is come out here and say, oh, hey, guys, everything's great. Forget about the headlines because it's not. We're human. We're going to feel this. But life's what you make of it. You get hardships. Try to turn them around. Let's make yourself harder. So that when the next time hardships come up, you're more, more geared for it. Uh, in closing, there is a book that talks about this very topic. It's called Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. And it's looking at, 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 at basically building yourself to survive, not only survive, but to thrive on the basis of these very, very negative stimulants. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to say thank you so much to everybody for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I'll be back next week, Tuesday at 1, Thursday at 1. I hope you have the time to visit with me again. Until then, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.